1964, there were new leaders in the Kremlin. Leonid Brezhnev and Alexander Kosygin seized power in a bloodless coup. Lyndon Johnson was elected president, annihilating the challenge of Barry Goldwater. Johnson was soon welcoming Britain's new Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, to Washington. But ominously, the US involvement in Vietnam was increasing, with naval forces patrolling off the coast. And 1964 was 99 years since the start of the Ku Klux Klan, when defeated Southerners banded together to confront freed blacks. Now there were renewed demands for real equality. President Johnson signed a Civil Rights Act into law on the 3rd of July. Some months before, three young men had started working in Mississippi to help blacks claim their new rights. Mickey Schwerner, aged 24, from Pelham, New York, had been working with CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, for more than six months. Andy Goodman was a 20-year-old student from Queens College, New York, anxious to take part in some positive action. Jim Cheney was a local boy from Meridian, Mississippi, who found respect for his color in the civil rights movement. The boys were repeatedly harassed by local police and then arrested on a charge of speeding and taken to Neshoba County Jail in Mississippi. The police records showed that they had been released at about 10 o'clock and they drove off in their car. This was discovered the next day, but everyone denied knowing where the boys might be. The FBI was called in, but it wasn't until six weeks later their bodies were found, buried in an earthen dam nearby. They had been shot. Although the FBI had received a tip-off, they were still up against a wall of silence. There was a national outcry, with the Reverend Martin Luther King leading demands for speedy justice. I think about the fact that it is urgent and it is important for the federal government through the FBI to use all of its resources to discover who killed those men. 21 suspected Ku Klux Klansmen were arrested, including the sheriff and deputy sheriff of the county, but at their arraignment, they showed justifiable confidence that the charges against them would be dismissed. This confidence reflected the tradition of white supremacy which had been reborn despite the defeat of the Confederacy in 1865. In the devastated southern states, former slaves were encouraged to assert their rights. As graphically shown here in D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, many sought revenge on former slave owners and their families. There was a rapid backlash. At the end of 1865, a group of young ex-Confederate officers met at the town of Pulaski in Tennessee to found a secret society, the Kiklos Klan. They adopted bizarre costumes like these to frighten uneducated and superstitious blacks and set out to hunt down any they suspected of harassing and oppressing whites. Within three years, there were clans in most southern states with more than half a million members. Klansmen believed that their movement had begun with high ideals, but the punishments they meted out soon turned to atrocities. The Klan was outlawed by Congress, and by the mid-1870s it had died away. But white supremacy had been firmly re-established in the former Confederate states, with the blacks being kept separate and impoverished. But the massive waves of immigration which brought millions to the United States at the end of the 19th century kept alive the fears of many poor whites in the cities and southern states that they would be overwhelmed by non-Anglo-Saxons. Cartoons like this from a North Carolina newspaper in 1900 
show how fear of Negro rule was widespread. The spark for the resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan was the success of The Birth of a Nation, the first silent film spectacular made by Southerner D.W. Griffith. This idealistic portrayal of the Klan appeared in 1915, and whether deliberately or not, Griffith reflected widespread fears of another challenge to white supremacy and the need to band together against this. By the early 1920s, the Klan was able to claim a membership of no fewer than five million people. Its objects of hatred had by now broadened from just blacks to include Roman Catholics, Jews, all foreigners and organized labor. The Klan became an integral part of Southern life, although it was always locally based with several competing organizations. Its members regarded themselves as the militant defenders of white values. At this period of its existence, the Klan was almost respectable. Local businessmen and civic leaders in the southern states openly joined, and being a member didn't stop a young lawyer named Hugo L. Black from later becoming a justice of the Supreme Court. The 8th of August, 1925, saw the amazing spectacle of 40,000 members of the KKK marching through the streets of Washington. Many of them waved American and Confederate flags to demonstrate their patriotism. Only the arrival of heavy rain dissuaded them from carrying burning crosses. However, it was to turn out that the Washington March was the peak of the Klan's power. Later that year, the Grand Dragon of its Indiana branch, or realm, was the center of a scandal involving the rape and death of a young woman. When his Grand Wizard expelled him from the Klan, he retaliated by revealing the Klan's political links and corruption. During the 1930s, membership fell to two million, and the Klan sought allies in other organizations on the far right. A natural companion was the Nazi-inspired German-American Bund, which had a similar hate list of blacks, Jews, Catholics, socialists, and trade unionists. On the 18th of August, 1940, the two organizations had a joint meeting at which the Klan sang Nazi marching songs and the American Nazis burned a 40-foot cross. And when Fritz Kuhn, America's would-be Führer, spoke at a rally of the Bund at Madison Square Garden, Klansmen were able to participate in some of the action they so much enjoyed. But as the United States went to war against fascism in 1941, the extremism of the Klan came to be seen as un-American and unpatriotic. However, as the war ended, the South to which soldiers returned was as poverty-stricken and prejudiced as when they went away. Although nationally the leading clan had been bankrupted in 1944 for not paying $685,000 in taxes, local replicas soon sprang up to defend the Southern way of life. Sometimes they were patronizingly friendly to blacks like this 107-year-old former slave who knew his place and deserved a visit from Father Christmas. But more often they warned that there were dangerous agitators around who wanted to end such southern traditions as maintaining segregated facilities. The clansmen prepared to take action against them. Not all the troublemakers came from the north. Many blacks and some whites who had served in the armed forces had been infected by all the promises about equality after the war. Now they were demanding equal, not separate rights. In May 1954, the Supreme Court overturned a hundred-year ruling that blacks and whites could be legally educated at separate schools. But integration didn't happen overnight. It was three years later, in April 1957, that nine black children enrolled at the high school in Little Rock, Arkansas. President Eisenhower had to send a thousand troops to make it happen. The crowd was inflamed by speeches from Klan sympathizers talking of dragging the black children out and lynching them. But the president sent in the troops, saying mob rule cannot be allowed. The Klans reacted with terrorism, kidnapping, murder, castration, and bombing black homes, schools, and churches. 
During the 1950s, dozens of small clans had sprung up again, many of them bitter rivals. But by 1961, many had been consolidated by Robert Shelton of Alabama as the United Clans of America. Politicians such as Governor Barnett of Mississippi echoed its beliefs. There is no case in history where the Caucasian race has survived social integration. We will not drink from the cup of genocide. The pressure for integration was maintained when James Meredith became the first black student to register at the University of Mississippi on the 1st of October 1962. Federal troops held off hostile whites who included Klansmen imported from as far away as Florida. Two people were killed and 200 arrested. By June 1963, unrest was coming to such a crescendo that President Kennedy went on television to confirm his determination to enforce civil rights. That same night, in Jackson, Mississippi, Medgar Evers, a field officer of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was shot and killed. Baron de la Beckwith was tried twice.